think we'll get this started. I think everyone hopefully is either in the room or in the along shortly. So um, I'd like to welcome everyone. And thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Kevin Noss, and I'm the chair of the Canadian Nursery Landscape Association Insurance Committee and owner and president of uh, Price Landscaping in Moncton, New Brunswick, down in the East Coast, where we're having a beautiful sunny weather. So I hope everyone's enjoying the same fall. So again, uh, thank you for joining this uh, insurance business insurance landscape town hall webinar um, today with our Marsh team. And Marsh is an integral part of our NLA's Hort Protect Insurance Program and our endorsed broker for the property and casualty or business insurance. Um, they also offer personal home and auto, auto insurance as well. I'm also joined today by uh, two colleagues and fellow volunteers with the Canadian Nursery Landscape Association. Carl Stenson, who has been on this committee, we won't say the number of years, but since day one, um, I'm sure the nurseries and Alan White with Turf Turf Systems, both from Ontario. Carl and Alan will help me with the Q and A at the end of the session. So, as this webinar goes along, if you have any questions, please use the feature at the bottom of your screen that says Q and A, and you can type in your questions at any time, and we will try our best to address them all at the end of the presentation for Marsh. Um, if it does disappear, a little note here that you can just even move your mouse around and usually it'll come back up. If not, that's the best way to get your question and answers into our into the queue here. But this time I'd like to welcome the Marsh team. I personally have worked with these people for quite a few years and they're very, very knowledgeable. So I'm very happy to have them all on board. And it is a team with Marsh. So we have David, David Amadori, although I said that close, David. He's a senior vice president with Marsh. Stephanie McDonald, the vice president with Marsh Canada, and John Talent, vice president with Marsh Canada as well. So they're all on your screen. They're all smiling. You can see them there. Um, as everyone knows, um, the, the business insurance landscape—no pun intended with the word landscape—but it's very been challenged over the past at least two years, if not more, and they will go into that more. And it's been making it increasingly difficult for landscaping and especially snow removal contractors to procure insurance. Uh, the current environment has resulted in impactful changes to the insurance marketplace um, relating to deductible structures, claim management, and availability of coverage. And we've all heard these stories and experienced some of these difficulties. It is very important more than ever for business owners to understand how to take control of this important business practice to help mitigate risks. So during this interactive town hall, the Marsh team will discuss the current state of the market. So maybe we can better all understand what's going on, how the market has evolved and where the market is going and what we can all do to help manage these, to manage our risk and, and help make our insurance program better. Marsh will discuss some of the solutions that have allowed them to discover a consistent insurance solution for our CNLA members while navigating through this hard market. So thank you very much for taking the time because I know you guys are very, very busy, David, Stephanie, and John, and we look forward to your presentation today. And again, if you have any questions, please pop them into the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. So right now, I'm going to, Stephanie, you have some Marsh, you have some slides to bring up, I believe. So Kevin, thank you for your, your kind words. And before we begin with our, our slides, I'd just like to, to again, 
emphasize that we recognize that that insurance has been very challenging for landscaping and snow removal contractors over the last two to three years. You are certainly a group of businesses that we are very happy to have been working with through our program, through the CNLA program for a decade or just over a decade. And we definitely want to convey to you that we are here to help. And that is a main focus of our, our webinar today. And with that, uh, Steph, if we can take a look at the, uh, the agenda. So we're gonna take a look at the current insurance landscape. We'll, we'll review the evolution of the insurance landscape, what has brought us to this. We'll have, have a look also at the evolution of the Hort Protect business program, our CNLA program. And we'll review the performance of claims management and, and the effect that it has. After that, we'll, we'll, have, we'll go through some things to consider, and then we'll, we'll finish off with some Q&A. And with that, uh, over to you, Dave. Sure. Thanks, John. So, uh, as, as we've heard and as we've all experienced, um, if you're in the industry, if you're in the business, there's, there's been a shift in the insurance landscape over the last um, little while. And although snow removal contractors have been, have been uh, challenged um, and at the forefront of that challenge, it's also other classes of business as well, specifically nursery centers and garden centers. Um, and we'll get, in, we'll get into that as well. All different sector groups of the CNLA constituency have been impacted um, uh, all the same and to varying degrees at the same time. So uh, let's just start with a little bit, a little bit of background on the, the insurance marketplace and, and the way that the, the verbiage that we use, we say hard market versus soft market, okay? And in a soft market, what we have are a lot of different insurers competing for the same premium dollars, the same insurance dollars. And ultimately that's downward pressure and lower price. In a harder market, for a variety of reasons, we have fewer insurers whom are willing to participate in specific classes of business and ultimately fewer insurance dollar, fewer insurance offerings creates upward pressure and, and uh, higher premiums. Things that contribute to this are really macroeconomic trends, but uh, catastrophes, fires um, and whatnot. When we see you know, um, forest fires in BC and X billions of dollars of, of damage, this really impacts the reinsurance market which in turn impacts the retail insurance market, which is how all of us on this call today um, participate. So where did, uh, where did the insurers go? Um, really, they didn't go anywhere. The appetites have, have shifted, right? And so um, as we've acknowledged, it's been a couple of years since um, since insurance has been sort of in crisis for different sector groups at, at CNLA, um, but even seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, I think um, some individuals on the call would would remember that it wasn't uh, it wasn't the easiest product to procure on an annual basis um, as well. And that was when we were in a really soft market. So, um, if we can agree for the purposes of this call that even in the best of times, some of the sector groups have been challenged. We're we're firmly in sort of the most challenging of times right now, exacerbating what what is sort of a, a problematic um, insurance placement for, for a lot of the, the members. I wanna talk a little bit, and I do this often, but I think it's important as a refresher uh, to talk about the breakdown of an insurance dollar because uh, from an insurance company perspective, um, when they look at a hundred cents on the dollar, they look at it a little bit different than, than um, maybe some, uh, some people would because this is their business. And this is the lifeblood of the business at the end of the day. What they'll, what they'll do is they'll look at zero to 60 cents and they'll say, okay, take in a dollar. I can expect to pay anywhere from zero to 60 cents in claims. I can pay a broker 15 to 20%. And I need to remain with 15 to 20% for, for my own operating costs to keep the lights on, to pay the salaries, to pay the benefits, et cetera. And hopefully somewhere in there, there's a little bit of underwriting profit for them. And profit's not a bad thing from the insurance company for an insurance company because profit allows for stability of rate and consistency of, of coverage. If an insurer remains unprofitable in a space for too long, they're likely to vacate that industry class and restrict coverage. And so we want 
insurers to be profitable in snow, um, but the idea is we want them to be profitable at, at lower rates. And we're gonna talk about some of those things um, today. Uh, snow removal industry in Canada, it, it does have some, some pre-existing insurance issues before we got into this hard market of the last two years. And that's really societal issues. Uh, this is this is the you know if I could sum it up, the ease with which one can make a claim against a, a contractor, um, be represented by a legal professional, and there's no real recourse. And so that that's something that's contributed not to worse work being done in industry, leading to more claims. The barriers for individuals to make claims against operators has has become more available at lower cost with no recourse. And that's really, really challenged insurance companies' ability to remain profitable because they're, they're forced to defend. Steph, next slide, please. Um, the evolution of, of the insurance landscape. And so we, we, let, we let into this, but there's, there's really been 20 years of, of societal change as it relates to Know, Canadian thinking about you know, ownership of our own of our own actions and uh, looking for for someone to blame. I'd say that's that's maybe a little bit unfair, but I know that's a lot of people's experience um, when it comes to defending claims. Um, we've we've shifted and sort of modeled ourselves a little bit more, taken the model that exists south of the border, uh, whereby if we if we have a fall, we're looking for for a handout or somebody to. Uh, um, to make to make a payment and and um, it's it's um, it's been something that again we've, we've we've taken the lead from the U.S. and that that model is very much here specifically in Ontario but also in, in Alberta. One of the things that could be contributing to the problem is is uh, more lawyers graduating from from legal schools in Canada looking for work and the big law firms not necessarily. Uh, growing at the same pace. Um, and so the path of least resistance for legal work, highly trained young professionals, um, they need to earn somewhere, they need to go into work somewhere. And it's, it's our estimate that this is part of the reason why more, um, more contingent, legal represent, contingent legal representatives are, are available um, today. Um, more uh, more individuals uh, entering into the uh, um, entering into, into the space. Uh, one of the things we hear the names we hear. I won't repeat the names because I don't want to give them more, more airtime. But the personal injury law firms. If you turn on turn on the AM radio, you're going to hear them. Um, some of these some of these aren't even law firms. They're big business. They they function. Some of them as clearing houses. Um, they market their brand that they'll be able to defend you if you'd slipped and, and, and fallen and, and sustained an injury um, and that there's no cost up front and you only pay should they should they be uh, able to win a settlement. Um, there's no costs that are that are passed on to that uh, to that individual. So um, it's been it's been um, a challenge and that uh, the awareness of free legal representation has been um, pushed forward with a, with a great degree. Talked a little bit about it before, but insurance companies um, looking to exit the space because they're not profitable. When we say not profitable, we mean the influx of claims and the, the requirement to, to defend and ultimately pay out claims um, has, has, uh, has been a challenge. And it's our estimation that the, the continual decision to settle a claim um, with a small economic payout to make it go away has, in my, in my opinion, exacerbated a problem. And that problem is that there's money available for all sorts of claims, even if they happen to be uh, frivolous or not substantiated. Um, and so uh, we've, we've, we've seen a lot of insurers uh, pay out to make claims go away rather than go through the process of, of defending. Um, and it's our, our estimation that it has a, sort of poured gas on a, on a fire um, and made things that much more challenging for, uh, for operators. As, as it comes to um, COVID, uh, there's a couple of points that are, that are worth note. Um, some of the, the slip and fall claims that have been outstanding for quite some time, 
uh, have been pushed along even further and so dragged out. Uh, and that's really as it relates to the uh, availability of court time and in turn, the lengthening of the, the tail. The tail on a claim is really um, the, the timeline since the actual incident to its, to its resolution. There's another thing to, to note. We've seen a significant reduction in claims um, through COVID, and this just makes good sense. This makes good sense for a couple of reasons. The big one is that we've seen less foot traffic. We've seen less foot, less foot traffic, and at the tail end of winter this year, um, we know about Bill 118 in Ontario, at least, coming into to effect. And so we hope those two things in general will yield more favorable results as we move forward and ultimately entice and, and um, intrigue more insurers to, to come back into the space. Next slide, please, Steph. Your, your, your insurance program, Work Protect. Um, we want to talk a, a little bit about the, the philosophy and some of the things that we do. And really, one of the things that makes makes the program unique and has been in place for quite some time. You're seeing a lot of other insurers do this now, but we've been doing it really for, for a decade. It's contract specific and location specific underwriting. What does that mean? That means that there's uh, some vetting of the types of contracts that are in place on the insurance program. Um, why that's a benefit to everybody that participates in the program is that we wanna make sure that your contracts give your legal representation the ability to defend you. And we think defense is, is very, very important. Um, and so we'll vet some of the hold harmless, um, so some of the hold harmless clauses. Um, consistency within our claims continue. When I say claims continue, I mean, what happens when we submit a claim? It's all the infrastructure and back end of the program that we put together at Hoard Protect to make sure that there's favorable results, as favorable as can possibly be, consistency of legal representation, and most importantly, uh, as we see, an insured philosophy to defend versus an economic settlement. What that means is if you're a contractor on the program and you showed up and you did what you're contractually obligated to do, your insurance partner is not looking to write a check for a couple of thousand dollars or five or 10 to make it go away. They're willing to go the extra mile for them if you have all of the documentation in order to support you with a defense um, and not to sort of reward bad behavior and, uh, and, and take a zero liability position to make sure that there's not a, a, a negligent claim on the contractor's rec record. Another thing that's different about the program versus some other options is a deductible structure. And this is really important to understand and be aware of um, at the time of your renewal, whoever is procuring your insurance program. All deductibles are, are not created equal. Some deductibles are applied only in the event that a payment to a third party has been made. And some deductibles are in place the moment a claim is set in, meaning the, op the contractor is going to be incurring all of the costs for an adjuster, for a legal representation, to go to discovery. And if that is a $10,000, if that is a $10,000 deductible, it's possible that uh, for every single claim, you're going to be incurring 10 grand of, of costs. And so uh, we've done it a different way where you have cost certainty at the time of renewal and a, and a promise of defense that's included in your premiums. Also uh, the broker team at Marsh, I won't, go, I won't go through it all, but the broker team at Marsh has been engaged in this, in this class of business, not just Snow, but for every other sector group as well for, uh, for over a decade now. And we really dedicate a substantial portion of our professional pursuits um, to, to the industry class and making sure that we're participating on committees, aware of changes and shifts on insurer appetites, and also on the legislative front and all the good work that the various provincial and national association does for, um, for the sector groups. Next slide, please, Steph. Quickly, we've talked about claims and claims management and that, and that claims continuum that I referenced, um, but I wanna give a little bit of data points here um, to sort of prove out some of the things that we say that we're, we're doing. Um, this is some, some data from, from our AIG partners and AIG was on the program for, for a decade. For every slip and fall claim that came in, 71% of those claims were closed at zero liability. What does that mean? That means the contractors were defended by a lawyer. They went to discovery. They, they moved forward um, with a defensible position from their legal representatives, and ultimately the claim went away. 
there were some costs incurred to have the lawyers um, to have the lawyers defend the contractor, but there was no additional deductible that was paid by um, by the contractor. Of the funds that were deployed to defend, uh, fifty percent went towards claims and claims payment, um, and so there were of the twenty nine percent solved with. Uh, the 29 percent that were solved with um, um, with a payment to a third party, about half of the funds went there, and about half went to um, expenses um, for uh, for defense. I've talked about different parts of it, but I think it's a good thing to to remember, uh, especially if you haven't found yourself in a position to go deep into the claims process. But really, there's some phases of the legal continuum. Uh, after a claim, there's a discovery period with phone calls with the with the lawyers at the at the contractor level. Then we move to a discovery where there's a representation from the plaintiff side and, and the defense side. Um, if it goes past the second discovery, uh, really what happens is we go to mediation, then a pretrial conference where a judge can make a decision on the merits of the case and should it need to go to trial. And if it's a decision has not been made at that point, really we, we go to, to trial. And so our, our intention providing a defense first philosophy is really to make sure that we build a repu reputation for the industry under court protect, that when we're sitting across the table with a contractor against a contingency lawyer who's really looking for a settlement because that's the only way that they're going to earn, that we maintain that zero liability position and we don't exacerbate a problem that exists in society today with snow removal contractors paying out claims consistently just because the economic model suggests that's the path of least resistance. Uh, next slide, please, Steph. Okay, so now we're gonna go through some things to consider. So how can you take control of your insurance program? Operational awareness is key when it comes to your insurance program. Um, make sure you're signing reasonable contracts that aren't to the detriment of your business. For example, if you're going to be signing a whole harmless agreement, make sure you're not agreeing to take on all the liability, but only the losses that arise out of your negligence as a storm removal contractor. Make sure your logbooks and storm removal logs are up to date. Make sure you're over-documenting any issues on site that you're seeing. Pre-site inspections are also key before the season starts. Make sure you're identifying any areas on site that are problematic and also identifying what areas of the site you're responsible um, for removing snow at. And finally, it's also important to understand that not all winter work is created equally. For example, there's a more inherent risk associated to commercial, commercial snow removal sites, for example, a Costco, um, just because of the nature of the site. So there's more foot traffic and more of a chance that someone will, will be suing who they think is a big box store. Um, versus, for example, a residential home. So administrative controls. Make sure you're choosing the correct deductible structure for, the, for your business, whether that's a indemnity-only deductible or a self-insured retention. Make sure you're obtaining certificates from your subcontractors, and we recommend that your subcontractors carry the same limit of liability as you carry or more. Um, this is because there's nothing really preventing uh, a claimant from pulling you into a claim uh, where your subcontractor was the contractor on site, but their insurance policy is your first line of defense. And be productive regarding your renewal. So reach out to your broker early, um, understand what's going to be coming up for your renewal, and also get them, the, get them the information they need to be able to appropriately advocate on your behalf when renewals, renewal season comes. Owning your information is also key. Make sure you're, you're reaching out for updated loss histories so you know what's on those loss histories, what claims are still open, and what kind of payouts have been made on those claims. And finally, it's important to choose the right partner. Make sure your broker partner understands your business and understands the business that you operate within. Hopefully that provides a little bit of an overview as to sort of what we, how we see the insurance landscape today, the product that's available to everybody that participates in, in a provincial association that's part of CNLA um, and gives a little bit of context as to uh, some of the challenges that are out there today and how we've, we've adapted to make sure that we put our best forward uh, consistently. Okay, um, thank you, David and Stephanie and John for introduction for the presentation. Um, I'm looking through the Q&A. So I don't see much happening there. So if anyone does have any questions, uh, please type them in. In the meantime, I think we have a few that we could pose to 
challenge you a little bit to take advantage of this time because this is being recorded and uh, probably sent out later on for viewing. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. Kevin, we received some ahead of time too. So uh, one, one of the questions, um, what are some of the things underwriters look for when evaluating what companies to take on in snow removal and how important is the size scale of operations versus any internal process, process to mitigate risk? I think that's a great question, Carl. So to just sum up, what are the things that underwriters are valuing in an operation when they're considering? And what are, what are the, the levers that, that, if I can rephrase it a little bit, what are the levers that we can pull that as an operator that may present us in a more favorable light? And it's a discussion that we have, we have op, uh, often, really. Um, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go backwards on this. Um, and so that question usually sounds like, well, I have GPS on all of my equipment and I have GPS on all of my vehicles. Is there a discount for that? Well, I've, I've vetted all of my contracts and all of my, um, all of my indemnity clauses allow for defense. Do I get a discount on that? The answer is no upfront. So, so what that's going, what that's going to do is, is allow for the company to present the best case scenario in the event of a claim, which has the ability to land the most favorable result should there be a claim. The reason that I say that is it's a fantastic thing to have GPS and a piece of equipment worth $100,000. Should there be a theft, there will be coverage if you've scheduled it on your, your insurance. If there's GPS, the likelihood that that piece of equipment is going to be recovered and then therefore no, no claim will be paid out in, in full and there'll be um, a, a lesser value attached to it. It's going to benefit the contractor moving forward in their, in their insurance experience. With respect to, to contracts, it's great that there's indemnity clauses that allow for defense and that will yield a better result in the event of a slip and fall um, claim. And so uh, that's, that's the back end of it. The first part of the question was what do underwriters look for um, really, it's, it's, it's something that, that, that we look for as well. We look for accurate information. We look for consol consolidated information in an organized way. Um, there's a lot of pain out there, but there's individuals that would, would call in and operators that would call in that, that really don't have accurate um, lists of information. They don't have accurate lists of vehicles or drivers um, that, are, that are up to date. Um, there's not a ready-made list of the, the properties that they're, that they're doing work for and on. Um, and that really presents a, a challenge for us to accumulate the information and present in, 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 a, in a coordinated way. So from an underwriter standpoint, if there's, if there's comprehensive organized data that's available, that's a really good sign because the likelihood that this is an organized uh, operation that has the finger on the pulse of risk management practices as well, it's that much more, more likely that you could pull the thread all the way, all the way through. So uh, organization of data, comprehensive, comprehensive data, um, that's going to allow you to, as an operator, you to put your best foot forward, but also for whoever's handling your insurance renewal for them to put their best foot forward for you as well. Go ahead, Alan. That's a, that's a great answer, David. And again, thank you to all three of you for the uh, the presentation you put forward. Could you maybe spend a little bit of time, because we're hearing a lot from members across Canada, both within your program and outside the program. One, where does insurance, is this is something the insurance industry um, and underwriters are picking on the landscape sector? Is it, are we uniquely seeing through COVID and other things, these, these uh, premium increases and pressures on uh, insurance risk management? Or is this something happening across the insurance industry as a whole. I know I hear bits and pieces from business owners that have, may have restaurants or other things, and they're seeing unprecedented premium increases as well in those sectors. Um, and then the second part of the question is, we're hearing a lot of rumors about uh, underwriters or brokerages and, and insurers not um, underwriting the snow portion of the business, but will continue with other commercial general liabilities. How does that fare within the program and outside the program, both in premium uh, 
assessment, but at the same time, if you've been denied insurance somewhere else or dropped somewhere, what kind of implications does that have in, in moving to another brokerage? Okay, so uh, the question, and I'll just sum it up to make sure, um, there's there's the sentiment that's out there that maybe the insurance industry in general is picking on, on snow removal uh, specifically. Is that true? And maybe what's happening in the insurance market elsewhere outside of sort of the CNLA uh, sector groups? Um, with respect to some insurer, the second part of the question, some insurers um, willing to write the rest of the operation, but carving out carving out snow. And is there an impact to the operator should they have uh, gone through sort of a cancellation of, of coverage? So I'll go back to, to the beginning um, there. And with respect to our, our insurers picking on snow removal, and it's, I'd say the answer, the answer is no, but that doesn't mean there hasn't been tremendous pain in the, in the industry as it relates to, to uh, coverage and availability of coverage. <clears throat> Excuse me. I said, uh, <coughs> pardon me. I said at the beginning of the uh, of the of the presentation there that uh, um, there's some macroeconomic forces uh, that impact the insurance landscape, and there's a hard market and a soft market. We're, we're very much in a hard market. What that means is that really every insurance premium, my own auto insurance premium included, is being impacted. There's lift. There's lift across all industries. However, as I said, if, if snow, <clears throat> excuse me, snow removal specifically in Ontario and in Canada to a broader sense um, was, was on the margins of where appetite for insurers was five years ago in the, in the best of times, a very soft insurance market, when we're in the hardest of times, we're, we're firmly on the outside looking in. So that, that's the experience of the snow removal contractor as it relates to insurance. It's very real. And there's been significant, significant increases over the last two and three years. That said, the market that's been hit hardest or the line of coverage that's been hardest, if you have a greenhouse. Sorry. Can you repeat that, Dave? Uh, is, that, uh, is that a little bit better? Yeah. yeah. So um, the, the line of coverage, the type of coverage that's in, been impacted the most over the last two years is really property coverage. And if you're part of CNLA, and you happen to have greenhouses, most likely you've been impacted to, to a significantly greater degree with respect to the, the percentage increase on your premiums than snow removal operates. That doesn't mean one is better or worse, um, it, but, but uh, typically a greenhouse business is generating um, higher revenues that the ability to absorb additional premium may be there where snow removal contractors may have been spending anywhere from five to 15% of gross receipts on insurance already. The, the ability to, to add increases to that simply makes a lot of operations unprofitable. So that's, that's how I would answer that, Alan. Hopefully that puts a, a, little, bit of, a little bit of context, but, but it's not just liability, it's, it's every line of coverage that's available. Some insurers, you're right, will decide to vacate the snow removal space but they would be interested in the remaining sector groups of sector groups, excuse me, of, of CNLA, and so um, that's that's simply that's simply uh, an example of, from my perspective, an insurer having a change in appetite, a change in how they're philosophically going to get involved with the space, and they deem it too high risk. There's almost no premium that they would they would be willing to the get into the snow space, as it relates to a cancellation of insurance, there's multiple types of cancellation. There's cancellation for non-payment, right? There's cancellation for misrepresentation. There's cancellation of coverage because an insurer left the space and that one would not penalize a company moving forward. If you didn't pay any premiums and there's a record of cancellation or if you, if you, if you receive the cancellation because there's some sort of misrepresentation, that's gonna be looked at very differently than insurance company ABC was no longer willing to offer coverage for this type of operation. Therefore, we find ourselves in a position to, to procure a new insurer. Hopefully that answers it. Yeah, that, that helps a lot. Again, it's the feeling they get because they, again, some companies that have been in with no risk or claim of risk uh, history or claim histories, 
state that they had a, a reasonable premium, and then once they got informed that they would be dropped on that portion of their uh, their insurance, then when they go to say group insurance or try to get it elsewhere, the premiums are so substantially higher. Is that the, their concern was? Is that a function of they got denied by the incumbent, they moved to another brokerage, or even again when they come over to the Hort Protect program? You're managing risk. We have obviously negotiated with the insurer uh, a program that works with the entire risk package. What what are the benefits and downsides? Again, a lot of our members are with your program, but a lot of members aren't. And as they come over to you, it's it's a big learning curve for them. Um, but there's also, I think, maybe you can clarify the point. How much more within a group program does that help them manage this risk themselves too? Because again, they're looking at all of a sudden this massive uncertainty in their business and their business model get changed if they make this new investment how likely is it to change again on them well i think there's i think there's something to be said about um the, the examples as as you've, you've put it you know you didn't have any didn't have any claims and there was no real insurance issue and you went through the renewals but then there was a claim um and you had a whole new ex, a whole different experience right uh and so in a situation like that um you know, sometimes we're a victim of our own success, right? And so uh, I've had discussions with members that don't participate on the program, but they've enjoyed insurance rates because they haven't had a claim where they simply go through a renewal and they're not on a radar for any sort of uh, other than pre-scheduled increase. And if that's the case, keep clipping along and having rates that simply aren't available in, in the market today until you're on the radar. And then, and then if you have 2014 rates in 2021 and you haven't sort of gone up, you know, over, over time, uh, the Delta between 2014 rates and 2021 is, is unbelievably substantial. And it's possible that that operator hasn't increased their, uh, uh, their their cost of doing business for the, for their client increase the, the the price tag um commend that 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 delta so that's unfortunate we we do um we do see that from from uh, from time to time but if you haven't had claims and you haven't had insurance issues um that's a really positive thing my advice and guidance on that would be to to anticipate um and bake it into your price pricing anywhere between five and 10% of your snow removal receipt, even if you're spending significantly less of that, you can, you can insulate yourself from future increases if your cost model allows for that. Is that, is that? Yeah. I think Carl had a question related to that. I think a good segue, Carl, I remember earlier on, just before this uh, webinar, you were chatting about how significant is your reporting and keeping your, your insurance information up to date with your brokerage and insurer. Well, that's that was um, one of the things that uh, it, it, you mentioned 2014, and some people um, that I've heard of anyway have not reported their um, their sales to their to their current insurance broker for six seven years, and it's just assumed that they're just going along at the same pace. They can come to you or another broker, and all of a sudden, there's they have to report their sales, and they report their actual sales. Right. which are double what they were in 2014. And it's how important is it for all of that information to be accurate um, when you are getting your quotes? Because what happens if something goes wrong and it's found yeah. out in the investigation? Well, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, we just were on the heels of talking about cancellation for non-payment and cancellation for misrepresentation, right? And so, and let's just say in that example, Carl, there's a there's a there's a business that has not reported any any revenue uh, increases since 2014, um, and then experiences a number of claims. In every insurance policy that I've seen, there's the ability for the insurer to request financial statements to validate the information that's on that application, right? So, can can the claim be denied then? Absolutely. So, and we're not talking about the the requirement that we're absolutely to to the penny in real time, but I think that the the best exercise um, that a lot of the clients on the program use they just report last year's twelve month sales and they're consistent in that approach. This way, it's not a forecasting of where we're going to be. It's not a sales exercise about what we think. We're just consistently reporting the prior twelve months. 
and there's there's no room for really error using using that model, right? Right. And, and if I could just add to that, um, insurance kind of functions on the idea of utmost good faith. So the insurer relies because they don't have a window into your business. They rely on you to give them factual data when it comes to reporting your revenues, reporting your, your property values and things like that. So if there is a misrepresentation, you can definitely get into trouble with the insurance company um, without advising them of that. And then we can get into the issues of canceling coverage or in extreme situations, if there's a claim, they can deny the claim as well. Um. I, I'm just going to change subjects here. There was a question online from Matthew, um, and he says, do you see something similar to Bill 118 in Ontario moving to other parts of the country? And I, I could probably kick in with that and say that Ontario did a huge amount of work to get that bill put through. And there's a lot of carbon copy there that can be um, reproduced in other provinces, but it's up to the provincial associations, uh, the provincial executive directors to go after that, because it's not the insurance committee that can go to, say, the Alberta legislature and, and make the proposal. It has to be from that province. So um, it was a lot of work, but I think, um, David, I think you can probably say that Bill 118 is in the future, hopefully going to mitigate increases or even start producing decreases. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly what I would anticipate. And you know, we're we're eight months in. We're eight months in um, to to the bill being enforced or just about, which means we're a third of the way to 24 months. And 24 months is when the proof will be in the pudding with a full complete data set. Um, I think we don't need 24 months, frankly but actuaries uh, at insurance companies will likely hold out for a real data set versus what, what I think. Um, lawyers that I've spoken to, and I spoke to the lead counsel that's represented a, a tremendous amount of the, the claims on the program since March became involved. I spoke to him this morning and he's optimistic as well, you know, as, as a lawyer would be, he didn't commit to, to anything, but he's optimistic about the, the nature of the of the legislation, as as I think we all should be, it just stands to reason that if we have sixty days to report rather than two years, there will be fewer claims that, that will come through. So I think it would be. I agree with you, Carl. I agree that the, the you know eighty percent of the framework is there, but it's up to local provincial associations to really drive this forward and replicate uh, and replicate that that model. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with that. Participating, as Carl did the Ontario Bill 118, but as a snow operator in Ontario, I can tell you how much peace of mind it brought coming into this winter, kind of already knowing how last winter shook out versus the, the typical two-year wait period. And they usually kind of come on your doorstep or in the mail just before that two-year expires. So um, this, this year, kind of already knowing where I stand from last winter before I even enter into uh, new and to mitigate risk too because it happens very quickly so if something needs changing before you get too far along in your business it's a lot easier to adjust with the, the new 60 days so anybody i, I know carl you're available uh, myself and anybody at landscape and Terra. in the there was a lot of background work that went on there's a lot that could be learned from it and replicate in other provinces uh, we're certainly willing to share and to uh, participate in doing what we can to to make that happen in other provinces I, be, I believe some of the executive directors have already received all of that information as well, and they're starting to or have are are working on it right now. Just looking at any other questions there. I don't see any right now. Um, one question I think it's a little bit relative. Um, you know, like the question I had was. And maybe it's unfair, but what have you seen on average for snow removal industry? I think that kind of all over the map, but and I guess maybe I would ask like for like our company, we're about to go in instead of quotes actually next week or two. Would it be fair to say you should contact your broker ahead of time to kind of see if let's say your renewal is not until I don't know, December or something? Um, instead of being caught getting into contracts with this winter. Uh, not costing out properly to some people don't want to ask the question they want to have their head in the sand i heard that from uh, some people that i know 
but is it fair to pay contact your broker to get an idea what the increase could be so you got yourself covered I, I, i'm i'm right on the where the rubber it's it's the road now this question like yeah i think i think there's there's a couple ways to answer the answer is pro, I, I think being proactive and having documentation and hand in conversations 90 days out is a, is a great idea it, it sort of gives an understanding of the the, the road that you're going to walk but I think the first part of the question, Kevin, was about like what are the what are the average increases? And what are what are increases in general right now? They're different for everybody. I think what's more important is to understand where your snow rate is. And I think we can take a step back and discuss what that means. A rate is applied to every thousand dollars of the type of business that you do. In this case, it's for every thousand dollars of snow. There's a specific dollar amount that that generates your your liability premium. Okay. And that can range between 50, really, on the, on the low, low end, that's, that's not really available, um, to, to 80. And that's kind of the sweet spot. I'd say even 60 to 80, really, is, is, a, is where a lot of operators are right now. So 6 to 8%. There's outliers on both sides. If you've had a lot of claims and, and haven't walked away from problem accounts uh, or locations that, that consistently generate claims, maybe you're, you're up at 90 or $100 per, per thousand. And the percentage. Kevin is is really applied to that to that rate, right? And if you have a, a thirty dollar per thousand rate, and you have a hundred percent increase, you're actually on the low end of average today. Now, if you have a hundred percent increase and you're at a hundred dollars, you probably can't continue with that business. And so, it's important to ask that question, have that conversation, to know to know what the true increase is going to be for you as an operator but also where you land in the, in the overall sort of picture relative to your peers and the insurance marketplace. Because from an insurer perspective, they're in their own insurance market with their, with their blinders on. And, and as I said, uh, Alan, a little bit earlier, if you're the victim of your own success, if you've had a $30 snow rate, and now you have a couple of claims, they're not gonna give you a 20% increase to just get to $36 per thousand because the market lives at six and 80. So it's a lot of sticker shock to, to, to get up to, to the market. Now, if you're within the 60 to 80 range or the six to 8% of each receipt, um, and you're hearing about a five to 10% or 15% increase, um, I think that's a lot of people's experience, right? We're starting to see flat renewals, meaning no increases. And we've even seen some go the other way in that the rate has been reduced. And so I think in five to 10 for 15% increases, if you're living within the regular market window today, that's what I think a lot of people are experiencing. Steph, Johnny, if you have any, any commentary on that, please, please weigh in. But that's, that's really been a lot of our experience. That's what we've been seeing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Question here yeah. from uh, Ricardo there, uh, Kevin, that's, He's just wondering why it's almost impossible to get insurance for a new company starting up. Steph, do you want to, uh, do you want to handle that one? Yeah, of course. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, and the reason is because of experience. Um, so when an insurance company takes on risk, they want to make sure that they're not kind of taking someone who just started in the business, who was just starting out because inherently there's going to be more risk associated to those operations. They want to make sure that person has been doing it for a while um, and really knows what they're doing, knows the, all the risk mitigation measures that need to be input, put in place in order for that business to be claims free and successful. Um, with regards to our program, we've been successful in negotiating kind of like experience. So perhaps if you haven't had your own company, but you've been working in a different company for five years, um, that's enough for us as your broker to go back to the insurance company and say, okay, you know, this is a new business, but they're not new to the industry. They've been doing this for several years and therefore they should be allowed in the program or at least considered under the program for a quote. Um, so really to get to the basic basic point of, of my answer here is the reason why it's so tough is because the insurance company before taking on your risk just wants to understand um, that you have some sort of experience under your belt before you take on this kind of new business avenue. Another challenge. There's another challenge there. I'll just jump in. Some new operators um, have the ability to get a contract and that contract could be 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars of, of revenue. Um, and so it's a challenge with no insurance experience at the forefront, but on, on a one contract basis with $30,000, $40,000 of revenue, 
the premium associated, we're talking about minimum premiums, an insurance company won't give a $1,500 premium in, in 2021. Um, it, it might be a minimum five or $6,000 premium, which is significantly higher as a, as a percentage basis than someone doing 300,000. Um, and so uh, that's, that's a challenge on a premium basis, uh, getting, getting the appropriate volume of work as a new operator, if you can get insurance, to offset from minimum premium threshold. So your, if your risk goes up as you're trying to get more volume to offset the minimum premium to- From an insurer, from an insurer standpoint with a $1,500 premium, they would be aware that that wouldn't even get them to a discovery room sort of, sort of thing. Right. So, so. Um, advice for those companies that are starting up, uh, is it makes sense then to get that experience if you haven't worked previously um, for another company that's it's satisfactory to go subcontract, work under someone else's insurance for a couple of years, uh, catalog all that experience, and then come back and, and kind of re-enter the market. Yeah, that, that's a great. It's a great point. If you're functioning as a subcontractor where you're not owning the contracts yourself, work with you know whoever's contracting it out to, um, in in this scenario to get uh, specific insurance letters produced and an acknowledgement of work. And it's, it's unorthodox, it's outside the box, it takes a little bit more effort, but you can document specific sites that the individual performed at, and you can ask for, for letters, of, letters of experience that are maybe a little bit more tailored than the standard uh, one that a system will, will pull. Uh, just further on that though, David, I mean, if someone is starting in business, they have to get insurance uh, somehow. So we're not saying that you won't give them insurance. You're saying that the insurance premium would be high, or are you saying you won't give them insurance? No, in, in today's in today's market, minimum premiums of about five thousand dollars is is where the the barest bones of of insurance coverage start. So if you're starting a business, and a five thousand premium is is able to be absorbed, then then you know, that's awareness that, that you need to have at the at the front end. The insurance market in general um, won't, like is having a, a challenge with snow. And so they won't be entertaining $1,500 snow, snow removal policies. But as Steph said, we've been able to, within the Hort Protect program, we've been able to sort of work with the insurance companies, think outside the box, put personal experience down and be able to get an offering in front of some, some new businesses. And that's just something that's simply not available in the marketplace today. When you mentioned personal experience, I mean, would this be experience of someone working for another contractor for 10 years and then starting on his own right. or her own? I mean, is right. that experience? You can say that that, that they, that previous um, manager would say, look, these guys have worked safely and they've done this for 10 years. And does that correct. That's, that is, that is correct. It takes documentation. It doesn't just take our word for it. Right. Right. And so there's like, like most things to be, to have a successful insurance arrangement in 2021, specifically with challenge classes, it takes over documentation, over communication, uh, diligence on, on record keeping and and really going going that extra mile. And so for somebody that's looking to to begin an operation, um, having all of that pulling up that documentation from from a previous employer or or general contractor that, that subbed it out um, would be ideal and a great starting point to see how we can help. Awesome. Uh, Kevin, there's a there's one question I saw in the their open in your opening comments that uh, Marsh is offering personal and home insurance. Uh, is, is that something for both us as employers and businesses, as well as employees of, of our businesses that's that can be uh, of value? Correct. There's a there's a group home and auto plan for for employees and, and owners that that uh, um, there's a, a 1-800 number. It's, a, it's our Marsh. It's our Marsh uh, personal lines um, team that that navigates group home and auto collective buys, um, and it's available to to CNLA membership in place. Just um, we have just a few minutes left, so I just encourage. Is any other questions from the audience? If they could type in the Q and A right away, uh, so we could end this on time. Got a few minutes left. 
so um and i'm glad you brought up that other um issue there alan about the uh, personal home and auto so was there any other quick questions alan or carl you yeah, could think ricardo ricardo has one here he's oh. just uh, um, Great. Well, just be being responsible for clearing the snow at your own work site count as experience as well, or does it have to be just the years worked as a subcontractor? I mean, I think um, Ricardo, if that's if there's a very specific, um, very specific instance, that's probably a conversation that we could take offline and and really get into the the details together. I think between John, Steph, and myself, all of our email addresses are are. Um, are in the windows right here so feel free to to reach out to us and and if if that is your experience we'll we'll do what we can to um to package things up and see how we can um put an offering in front of you for you to be able to consider yeah i think that's yeah, valuable right there that information just the fact that you guys obviously as a broker and of the managers of the heart protect program are here as much to help businesses succeed as you are to help us navigate the insurance world Kevin, just one one last thing on that um, personal home and, and uh, vehicle insurance. Um, is that something that each company has to sign up for first? Or can any member of any company that is on the plan just call you? Yeah, Landscape Ontario member has access to it. So if you're you're part of the if you're part of the the group of companies that um, uh, the that belong to, excuse me. LA. Did yeah. I say LO and not CNLA? Yes. Ex excuse, excuse me. <laughs> Apologize for my my Ontario centric. Yeah. But um, I guess what I was saying, Dave, David, David. CNLA program. <laughs> what I was asking is, does the employee of my company, I mean, we're on the insurance program, but can an employee of my company right now? call you up and say, I need a, uh, uh, my company's a member of this plan. Can I'm, I get I'm a full-time, I'm a full-time employee of Sheridan. There's no reason, uh, there's no reason, Carl, that's known to me that a full-time employee of, of Sheridan wouldn't have access to entertaining a quote through the facility that CNLA has uh, to everybody across the country. Okay. So that's something that we should um, uh, more publicize later on. It's a, it, it's a different uh, part of your company too. So you said it's a different 1-800 number, 1-800 number and they would facilitate. Yeah, that really when you get into that, you want to make sure that it's, it's somebody who's doing personal insurance all day, every day. It's really in their, in their, right. John and myself. Right. Do, do okay. Establish. Yeah. Right. We're almost at a close. Um, I don't think there's any other questions there. I had one, but I don't think we can get it answered in a minute. So maybe we'll leave it at that. It's more vague, uh, but the, Anyway, so I guess for now, I think that's great. If anyone has any more Q&A, they can type them in or as uh, David alluded to, um, their email addresses are all there on the screen or you can go on to the Hort Protect. It's hortprotect.com, is that correct? Yes, and uh, go through that route. And Rebecca has all the information there as well in the chat. To ask to ask any questions or to get more information about the program, and I know anyone would be these people or other people from Marsh would be happy to talk to you. So with that, I think that concludes it. Thank you very much for all your time and your wisdom, guys. Appreciate it, and we look forward to bigger and better days ahead for CNLA. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for having us, everybody. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thanks, everyone. And Kevin, Kevin, just as a reminder, um, there is another webinar October 22nd. Thank you. Thank you very much October for with our People's Corporation, which is our live or our um, health and benefit program. That would be very important to watch as well. Thank you very much, Colonel, for reminding me. Thanks. Thanks. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, guys.